Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Saturday, April 24th, 2021, and today we're going to be talking about Washington, D.C., potentially becoming the 51st state in the United States. Washington, D.C. statehood has been something that the Democratic Party hasn't taken a national standpoint on until recently. D.C. statehood has been one of the most important things, I think, for those in the establishment Democratic Party, as it would allow them to represent nearly 700,000 constituents in Congress, uh, despite them already having representation on the Electoral College. In addition, I'm sure that it's no secret that D.C. is largely a Democratic area, which means that on routine, there would be two Democratic senators and one Democratic representative that probably won't change for at least the next couple of decades. But that isn't the main reason why House Democrats want to pass D.C. statehood. D.C. statehood has been something that has been, while in a sense unpopular amongst the American public for a little bit of time, has been requested and in a sense required by the uh, constituents in the District of Columbia, the United States Constitution does not prohibit D.C. from becoming a state. I implore you to do your own research about that. I'm not going to go too in-depth as to why. All it requires is that there is a federal district, not that the District of Columbia, as outlined today and based off the current borders, needs to remain uh, that federal district. It can be narrowed up into the National Mall and surrounding buildings, and then those constituents there can still find themselves represented in Congress. Because it does go back to the traditional message that America was founded on, no taxation without representation, yet D.C., as the capital of the country, has no representation in this country. So let's move on. Let's talk about what happened in the House yesterday when they passed D.C. statehood. Now, this uh, was something that was actually not yesterday. If today is the 24th, I think my sense of time might be just a little convoluted here. But uh, pretty much, you know, what D.C. statehood happened, this was the second time in United States history in which the House passed legislation to make D.C. the 51st state. Uh, this was not something, like I had said before, that was popular amongst Democrats or Republicans. In fact, in 2019, when you look at the polling data then, 64% of Americans opposed D.C. statehood. Now, the numbers are a lot better. A lot more Democrats, which is why the number is a lot better, a lot more Democrats are more open-minded to the idea of uh, D.C. statehood. It's just something that has been uh, circulated around the mainstream media, circulated around local, statewide, and national politicians, that now the Democratic Party is looking at it and saying, wait a second, why not D.C. statehood? Because 29% was not nearly enough for the House to justify passing it back in 2019, but the numbers are a lot better, I would say, for D.C. statehood today. And just looking at the passing of D.C. stated, I think that this is very interesting. So this is from Delega Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton. She is Washington, D.C.'s uh, shadow representative. I think that's the unofficial term for it. Essentially, she goes into the House. She has no voting rights at all in the House. So she is just there. She can uh, propose legislation, but she cannot vote on it. So it's essentially saying she can put something out there, but she cannot vote on it. And it's up to the uh, members of Congress that are not, you know, from Washington, D.C. It's just up to them, not up to her at all. There was no say in it whatsoever. But the Democratic Party passed this bill 216 to 208. Pretty much all of the Democrats supported it. There was not a Democrat voting against it. Now, not all of the Democrats or all of the Democratic seats from the 2020 election were there. There are 222 seats in the Democratic uh, party from the House of Representatives that were elected in 2020. Some of them did not vote. Some of them are not there because of vacancies. Uh, Joe Biden has nominated some of these Democrats from House districts here into the White House for positions. So they have resigned. They have retired their seats. Special elections are underway. So not all of the House seats are filled. There are plenty of vacancies throughout every single uh, Congress. So keep that in mind. It's not something new that's uh, pertaining just to this administration. But 216 to 208. Now it's going to go to the United States Senate. And Eleanor Holmes Norton says that the Democratic Party had a moral obligation to pass the bill, saying, quote, this Congress, with Democrats controlling the House, the Senate, and the White House, D.C. statehood is within reach for the first time in history, end quote. So essentially, she is putting all the pressure on the Democratic Party. She is saying, because the Democrats won the presidency, because they won the Senate, because they won the House, they must pass D.C. statehood. It is not a question. This is not up for debate. She is saying it is on them. There is a moral obligation. The Democrats have the power, so why not do it? Now, it's a little bit trickier than this. Before you ask, yes, D.C. statehood can 100% be filibustered. That is what the Democratic Party is worried about in the United States Senate. 
If you've seen all this discussion about abolishing the filibuster, that is mainly because of DC statehood. See, reconciliation is this method in which uh, through the budget and through just uh, pretty much messing around with the Senate rules, I would say, uh, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, whichever party is in power can pass a lot of things uh, if it's categorized under the rules because apparently the $15 an hour minimum wage could not be passed under reconciliation. But it's something that cannot be filibustered. That's the main takeaway. Reconciliation rarely occurs more than once a year, and it can be used to propose legislation that can be just shot out with a simple majority vote, 50 with the incumbent party in the White House or 51 under a traditional year. So it doesn't necessarily need those 60 votes that a traditional uh, bill would need. Now, for D.C. statehood, it can absolutely not be characterized under reconciliation. We're talking about adding a new state to the union. And since there is not as much Republican support as there is uh, Democratic support for D.C. statehood at all, Republicans have been very opposed to D.C. statehood. And it would take not just one Republican or two or three, but 10 Republicans to vote in favor of D.C. statehood in order for this to bypass filibustering, which means that this can be filibustered. But until they get the 60 votes to end the filibuster, it's going to die as a filibuster uh, in the filibuster. So pretty much D.C. statehood is at a crossroads here where it's forcing Democrats to consider abolishing the filibuster altogether, meaning that there cannot be a prevention of the minority party from the majority party of passing major pieces of legislation, or keeping the filibuster and D.C. statehood will just have to wait. Now, for the House, there is no filibustering. The House cannot prevent this bill from passing. It went into a debate, and then it went to a vote. The Democrats passed it. That's not going to happen in the Senate. That's exactly why in 2019, when the Republicans were in control of the Senate, D.C. statehood did not even make it through. You know, they didn't even bring it up for consideration because it was up to the majority party at that point. But D.C. statehood essentially uh, would die in filibustering. There is no way and no reality in which you get 10 Republicans to jump on board. In fact, there would be more of a reason for Puerto Rico statehood to happen just because of Republican support. You might get both Republican senators from Florida jump onto it, and then you might be able to find two or three more, but you probably won't get to 60 with Puerto Rico statehood. But the thing is, it's easier for Puerto Rico to become a state at least by Senate vote not by House vote, but by Senate vote, if it made it past the House stage, which it very well could if the Democrats were able to get a number of Republicans from uh, Florida, with just a few Democrats in a post. Uh, but for the Senate, Puerto Rico statehood would be an easier option. But just looking at the fact that the House has now passed it for the second time in United States history, this is not something the Democratic Party is going to give up. But the thing is, they only have the opportunity to do it now. 2022 is not going to be this year where the Democratic Party will be favored in the House. The Republicans are absolutely favored in the House. The Senate is an entirely different story. Why? Because of gerrymandering. In every single race that mattered, the Republican Party was able to win in 2020. 2020 was a census year, which means it is in tune for redistricting, which means that all of these Republicans that were elected and Republican legislatures that flipped, they now have control, partisan control of the redistricting process. That means Texas, Florida, states that were within single digits on the presidential level have unanimous Republican control as to how these districts are drawn, which, which means gerrymandering will go into a full effect in favor of the GOP. In fact, Florida alone can reverse the Democratic Party's majority in the House. Solely Florida can draw just eight districts, six, seven districts, actually, that favor the Republican Party that were previously, you know, favored for the Democratic Party that they could essentially just take Florida, redistrict it, and the Democratic Party, if everything else holds true, will no longer have control of the House. And it's not just that the Republicans have control in Florida. They have control in Texas and a number of other states, southern states, uh, you know, northeastern states, New Hampshire, just went to control of the GOP. So pretty much, you know, the Democrats are screwed in the House. So passing it now will probably be the last time the Democrats or any party passes D.C. statehood for a, the next couple of years, at least. So if it is to happen, it needs to happen now. And it's not as if the American public is as opposed to D.C. statehood as they were back in 2019. I think since the Democratic Party took this to a very much national level, and a lot of polarizing uh, politicians have come out and said they support D.C. statehood, that starts to ramp up public opinion in favor of it, especially amongst the Democratic Party. If your favorite senator or candidate is saying, I support D.C. statehood, chances are you're going to take a second look at it and say, well, if I support this candidate, why don't I support D.C. statehood? I understand the whole idea that D.C. has never been a state, 
But for someone who lives right outside the district, district, I can tell you it's a very popular issue amongst the constituents. And at the end of the day, we should not necessarily be asking the American public how they feel about this, but rather the constituents in Washington, D.C. North Dakota is not going to be impacted by D.C. becoming a state. Tennessee is not going to be impacted by D.C. becoming a state. You know who will be impacted by D.C. becoming a state? Washington, D.C. residents. And I can tell you without a doubt, D.C. residents support D.C. statehood. That's based off anecdotal evidence. That's based off polling data evidence. That's based off voting history. You can go into D.C. and you will find a D.C. statehood sign at almost every single stop sign. I don't think that's a coincidence. But let's take a look. If we're looking at the data based off of the uh, recently done polls, the Data for Progress poll, which does back D.C. statehood, found that 54% of likely voters back statehood. Well, that's a very big difference than 29%. But when you take a look at the polls that aren't necessarily partisan, so you can look at the Fortune Survey Monkey poll that shows that 49% of Americans support statehood, that's still a significant increase from 29%. Or if you look at RMG Research, where it shows 35% support statehood, you might be questioning, is that a big jump? But it found that just 41% oppose DC statehood, compared to 64%, according to the Gallup poll. So data over time has certainly changed, but public sentiment had not changed for decades, until 2020, when a number of candidates and a number of mainly Democrats came out in support of DC statehood. Very few Republicans, but there are still out there. There are always exceptions to the rule. But pretty much... The Democratic Party single-handedly changed public opinion on D.C. statehood. And the argument does make sense. You see, the reason why people ask for D.C. to become a state is because they look at D.C.'s population and say, wait a second, they have a lot of people. And before you bring up the question, does every state deserve representation? First of all, sorry, every city, every major city, the answer is yes. But does that mean we're making it its own individual state? No. I want you to circle back to that argument because I've seen it in my comment section down below. Ask yourself, does Chicago have Senate representation? Yes, they do. Do they have House representation? Yes, they do. When you go to Wisconsin, does Milwaukee have House and Senate representation? They do. Does Detroit? Does Philadelphia? Does New York City? Look around. The answer is always yes, except for Washington, D.C., so that argument never made sense. The argument that cities, do they deserve representation? Well, they already have it. They already have representation. I cannot understand why the Republican Party thought they would pop off with this argument because it doesn't make sense. Yes, every city has Senate and House representation. No one is arguing that every city should be a state. What they are arguing is that D.C., which has more people than Wyoming, and Vermont should have representation in Congress. For a country that was founded on no taxation without representation, having its nation's capital have taxation without representation, you question whether or not the United States is hypocritical or ignorant or just overall wants to intentionally disenfranchise Washington, D.C. voters. Because while they can vote on the presidential level and have voted in decades of elections, it doesn't really matter if they can't have their voices heard in Congress. Because those three electoral votes, where no politician even visits D.C. because it's not competitive, they really do not get representation. And the argument that D.C. residents already get representation solely because Washington, D.C. has Congress, and that yard signs can sway Republican and Democratic uh, representatives and senators, are you kidding me? Just because someone strolls through a neighborhood and sees yard signs, they're going to change their position for South Carolina's 4th District or Wyoming at large? Think about that for a second. No, that's not how it works, and that's never how it's worked. So for D.C. to become a state, it would need to pass the United States Senate. It would need to already pass the House, which it did up until you know now. It was not official until now, but we knew it was going to happen. But the Senate is a whole number, another mammoth. I mean, this is something that it's going to take a lot of energy on the Democratic side, a lot of lobbying, a lot of phone banking, a lot of calling Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly and John Tester and those swayable Democrats to convince them that this is the right move. Because if they aren't on board, if just one Democrat says no, it's done. Because it would require abolishing the filibuster, which takes a majority vote, which can be done. But then it takes D.C. statehood another 50 votes. They would need a yes on both.
And right now, it seems to be a number of senators are a no on one, and a few uh, are a no on both. So overall, D.C. state is going to take a little bit more. It's going to take uh, a lot. And if you're wondering what the Republican Party's opposition to D.C. statehood is, it's solely because of its Democratic composition. Look at D.C. really quickly before I end this video. Look at how Democratic it has been over the past few years. An 87-point margin for Biden. No other state even comes close. The largest margin in the 2020 election, you have West Virginia, you have Wyoming. Outside of that, D.C. completely does better than them in terms of partisanship. And look at it. Even when the entire country was red. Back in 1984, D.C. was that blue, shining capital in the entire country. Minnesota almost went to Reagan. But D.C. went to Mondale by 71.7%. You heard me. When the entire nation went red, D.C. went blue by 71.7%. Wow. What an astonishing margin for the Democrats in D.C. Never once in D.C.'s history has it voted for a Republican. Never has it voted for a Republican. So the Republicans realize this means never will there be a Republican senator for the foreseeable future. Never will there be a Republican representative for the foreseeable future. But the same can be applied to Maryland or Delaware or California. So why D.C.? It's because it would be a new state. It would be another state that would add two new Senate seats. The only reason they oppose it is partisanship. And I never understood that as an argument either because you would never disenfranchise voters just because they disagree with you. But again, I'm not Mitch McConnell. I'm not Kevin McCarthy. I don't sway these voters. I don't win these voters over for the vote. I don't whip them. Whatever it is, you know, D.C., the reason why it's opposed solely and only, not because of the Constitution, because it doesn't say D.C. needs to remain the way it is. So that argument thrown out, city argument thrown out, the only argument that they have is that it's a power grab from the Democrats to add two new Senate seats. But the thing is, you could never and should never argue that because an area is too blue or too red, it should not become a state. I do not think that this argument should be held true. I think if D.C. becomes a state, it paves the pathway for a number of territories and commonwealths. And yes, I do think that those should become states if D.C. becomes a state. But D.C. has been at the front of all this for the longest time, Puerto Rico as well. I think those will be the first two to go to become states if they do end up becoming states. But for D.C. in specific, you know, D.C. state had just passed the House. The Democratic Party seems to be moderately on board in the Senate. We're talking about 44 sponsors here, co-sponsors, but it all comes down to the final vote. It all comes down to the lack of Republican support because this will be filibustered and will likely die as a result of that unless the Democrats abolish the filibuster. But with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, it probably won't happen. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 midterm election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.